Hey there. Welcome to the making of Bionicle 2 Legends of Metra Nui. We're going to take you on the ultimate behind the scenes of not only the new movie, but the world of Bionicle. Along the way, you will see this icon pop up in the bottom right corner of your screen. When it comes up, select it with your DVD remote control and you'll get even more information. And later on, we'll give you an insider look at the new Bionicle figures for 2005, but we're going to make you wait for that. First, we're going to Los Angeles to meet the filmmakers of this second Bionicle film, which actually takes place before the first movie, Bionicle Mask of Light. In both cases, it's all about the Toa. We wanted to get really down to a Toa story. Uh, you know, the, the heroes of the universe of the Toa, they've been given the Toa stones, but they really don't have the, the, the power, the, the mask power is what really sets a Toa apart from every other character in the universe. And it takes a little while. You, you'll see if you watch the film that everyone has a little learning journey. I was wrong. You were right, my brother. <laughs> it's amazing what you can learn when you're not always speak teaching. What did you say? I didn't say, and why the mask glowing? But Vakama struggles to find his way. We thought it was a really cool idea to have Vakama have waking dreams, and that those are the things that he should be following but doesn't really believe in enough to follow himself, but actually other people help him follow those dreams. Meanwhile, Makuta was lurking in the shadows, gathering power. I think if he was bad in the first film, this film, he's twice as bad, three times as bad. He's just really, you can really see uh, the essence of his evilness. The creative team always kept the stories rooted in its Lego origins. The story for Bionicle should be like a, a very Lego experience uh, in that you have a, a collection of story elements, pieces, bricks of, of story that you can put together in different ways. And Lego is where Bionicle all began. So we hopped on a plane to Bill in Denmark where Bionicle was created. Hi, I'm Lars Koh. I'm the marketing manager on Bionicle. I'm going to take you to the project room where everybody who works on Bionicle are gathered. Come along. So over here we have the project management and the marketing management people. And over here we have part designers and internet designers and part designers over here as well. So everybody who works on Bionicle are in this room. Before Bionicle, two early models called Slicer and Robo Rider were popular. But the team wanted to create a new line of action figures. We were sitting and trying to, to find out what to do. Uh, the next step was to, to make a story that you could build on from year to year. And Bionicle is, is sort of a, it is a kind of a story that, that is, it's made to be as big as anything. From there, the designers took off, creating new action figures and masks. When we start designing a, a new line of Bionicle, uh, we have different skills. And some of us are good at drawing, some of us are good at, uh, at sculpturing. Next, we stop by the Lego factory to see how Bionicle parts are manufactured. First, colored plastic granules are suctioned by tubes into machines, where they are heated and shaped. This process is called injection molding. The new part is then ejected and dropped into a bin. These Vaki tools are checked carefully. Robots then drive around the factory and pick up the full bins. The parts are then transported for packaging and shipping. Remember that sneak peek at the new Bionicle figures for 2005? Soon. But before that, let's go back to Los Angeles to find out how the filmmakers brought the city of Metro Nui to life. It's an urban utopia that was the most perfect, most dreamlike city in the world to live in. And Tom Metro, with the towers that, that where Bakama has his foundry, you know, we made those the uh, the towers that actually created the clouds in the, in the environment because they were they were putting out you know these big puffy clouds. So we brought them to life. As you build a city building. Someone has to put up the structure of it, the, the metal rebar, the framing, and then put the brick or the stone on the top of it and add the windows. We have to do the same in the computer to create the city. In creating such huge and detailed landscapes, the team had to come up with new ideas to solve problems. Normally when you do a big cityscape, you, the, there's stuff moving around. There's birds, planes, and, and, and whatever flying through the sky. But the scale at which they'd made the buildings was so large that if you put a bird in into the shot, that, that would have been ridiculous. So what they actually had to do is they had to invent these enormous blimps that are you know, for the size of a sports arena floating through the, you know, to give the impression of there being you know, life in the skies. In the early part of the film, the giant pillars that come out of the floor, and that was very challenging, trying to figure out how the characters would 
ride those almost like a surfer would waves and how they would stay upright standing on something like that's dropping and rising. Surfing is exactly what inspired that scene. I went to the North Shore of Hawaii and I was out in uh, 18 foot high swell. If you look at what happens in the Coliseum when the, the you know, the toe are suddenly being crushed by these 30-foot waves of uh, steel coming down on them. That's, that, that's born out of a very genuine and personal fear. The process of making an animated film is actually a lot like making a regular film with actors and sets, except our sets are drawn on paper and computers. At the same time the story is being written, uh, the characters are defined, then we go into our storyboarding process. All of our film is drawn out, just like you would see in a comic book. We move that process forward into layout, where all the sets are created three-dimensionally on the computer, and our characters are put in there. And then from that point on, we go into animation. And our animators are actors with computers. A lot of the animators have a mirror at their desk. They're sitting there with their mouse and keyboard, and their, their face is changing, and they're really getting into it. After the film is animated, sound is created and added. With animation, um, you're starting with a clean slate. There is no sound. You have to create the world that you're in from the simple wind background or water background to what their footsteps sound in a particular environment. So when Nidiki spires across the bridge, we taped 12-point pins on three fingers of each hand and perform his footsteps going, going across the screen. Music is then composed and added. I have a small grand piano, and I sit there with a sketch pad, and I work out the different theme. For Kraken and Nidiki, they're a lot of fun. They are these horrible bad guys that are really out to get these Toa. But then there's these comedic moments. So when Kraken's doing his thing, a lot of, you know, boom, boom, you know, timpani kind of stuff, and a lot of dark, uh, lower instruments. And with Nidiki, he's almost spider-like. So, so I, I'll tend to keep those elements of Kreka and then add, like, piercing violins to really sort of add a shriek to him when he's when he's on camera. In the end, the filmmakers decide what part of the Bionicle story is told in the movie. But there are other ways fans can learn more about the story. There are events in Legends of Metro Nui, for example, the fact that the Toa don't use their elemental powers very much in the early part of the film. You can watch the movie, enjoy the movie, understand the movie without knowing why that is. But if you read the books and you read the comics before the movie comes out, you'll understand that. We talked the filmmakers into sharing some cool story ideas that didn't make it into the final film. We've got the low rack kit. These are designs for what the creature was going to look like on our film. In the script, we had this great little scene that we just didn't have time to pack into the movie, but it was a great action sequence. These low rock come like zooming out of the wall from all over the place, flying in, and they, they've got these kind of hook tails that grab hold of uh, Turaga Likan, and they grab on, and then they fly round and round in circles and loop in, tightening like a boa constrictor. A little bit of a, uh, a secret here is one of the last remaining scenes from this old sequence of the film is when Toa Likon said, someone must take charge. And that's the last remaining scene from this whole section that was eventually taken from the film. But anyway, we hope you uh, enjoy taking a look behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, what about the new Bionicle action figures? This is actually what we have in pipeline for you guys for 2005. So we have some cool new stuff here. The new uh, Toa Hornica, with, uh, you can see the new tools with uh, this ice axe with the uh, two color moldings and and also back on that he's going to have this flame sword with soft material, it's kind of nice. This is actually one of our blue dot models that we use for consumer testing and this is what the finished result is going to look like um, and this you'll, you'll see in 2005. It's pretty neat, huh? Thanks, guys. Well, that's it. Hope you had as much fun as we did exploring the behind-the-scenes world of Bionicle. <laughs>